Hello, welcome to our next screencast that is actually our final section of Ancient China. The title of it, as it should be in the title in your Google Doc notes, is Han Contacts with Other Cultures. Uh, I'm going to skip the if you were there, even though I know some of you absolutely love it, so you can read that on your own. Um, we're actually going to do a project all about the Silk Road, so I will just do the overview as it does in the textbook, but um, in addition to this video, you're also going to see a, a few different links to resources about the Silk Road, and we're eventually going to create a project about the Silk Road. I'm not going to do the project until after you guys take the test this Friday, okay? So I just want to finish doing the content here so you can take your notes and start reviewing for Friday's test. Okay, here we go, our last section. So farming and manufacturing is usually something we talk about at the very beginning, uh, and we did with China, right? We talked about the two major rivers, and those rivers led to silt. Those The silt uh, led to a desire for more rich soil, so agriculture, not agriculture, uh, irrigation was developed, around those rivers and eventually China developed one of the largest farming regions still in the world today as we talked about last month. Um, but now we actually see some advancements in farming technologies and manufacturing technologies and I think we've talked about this before but manufacturing is just making things but making things in a more sophisticated way right as opposed to one person doing uh you know creating something all the way from start to finish manufacturing is kind of like that division of labor that we talked about way back in september where you've got a lot of different people with different jobs uh, that all contribute to the creation of some sort of product the product mostly that we're going to be talking about today is silk i'm sure you have something that's silk or in your home or your parents have maybe a silk shirt or i don't know or maybe a silk pillowcase or Whatever, you can ask them, or maybe a silk scarf. Uh, it's a really, really nice fabric um, that at the time when it was created, no one had ever seen before. And the Chinese created it in such a way that they, they kept the method secret. So we'll get more into that as I go down. But All right, so the first Roman numeral that you guys should have in your notes that we quickly took last week, Thursday, is farming and manufacturing. So, as I said, a lot of advancements and increased productivity, right? So a lot more things are being made efficiently. Um, and, as we'll read, because they're creating product that a lot of people like, they're making contact with people of other cultures. I'm also uploading a um, TED-Ed video about the Silk Road, so some of the things might be a little repetitive, but I think it's nice for you to see the animated version of it. And it starts out saying, we are such a global world today, and we sort of take that for granted, but that is not the way that the ancient world was. There was trade, of course, but not until this really sophisticated network of a lot of different roads, whether they were on land or by sea, uh, were formed, forming the Silk Road, was there such an opening up of a lot of different cultures interacting with one another. So that's what we're talking about today. All right, so I showed you this image when we talked about art, uh, the, the figure painting, and then just art of everyday kind of life. So I showed you this one on, on uh, Mondays, so you'll already see this image. All right, so I'm going to read to you, starting here. By the Han period, the Chinese had become master iron workers. We already talked about how India worked with iron well, but now here's China working with iron well also. They manufactured iron swords and armor that, army that made the army. Sorry, I can say that again. They manufactured swords and armor that made the army more powerful. Farmers also gained from advances in iron. The iron plow. Remember, one of the earliest inventions we talked about in Mesopotamia was the plow. But it was a plow made of, what's your guess? Wood. Really weird to be asking these questions to an empty house, but fine. So they made an iron plow, much more efficient than a wooden plow, uh, and they have the wheelbarrow, which we talked about with Mesopotamia too, a single-wheeled cart, increased farm output. Uh, so they were a lot more agriculture, a lot more surplus, 
then it means a lot more people are being fed, which means a population explosion. We've talked about this concept many, many times. Okay, here's something new. Another item that increased in production during the Han Dynasty was silk, a soft, light, highly valued fabric. For centuries, Chinese women had known the complicated methods needed to raise silkworms, unwind the silk threads of their cocoons, and prepare the threads for dyeing and weaving. Just as your English teacher, note the spelling of dyeing, right? It's because we're talking about dye, okay? As opposed to remove the E, dying, right? No longer living, right? So interesting word you don't see all that much probably, but that is the correct spelling. The Chinese were determined to keep their, the procedure for making silk a secret. Why, right? If it's a secret, that means that it's uh, going to be in higher demand because other people can't produce it really easily. A lot of people are creating clothes out of cotton and out of linen. That's really common. It's not as luxurious and nice and sought after. Silk, people didn't know the process that was used. It was also a harder process, more labor intensive because you have to raise these silkworms. You have to wait until they create the cocoon. Uh, imagine the labor intensive job of unraveling the cocoon, putting that on a loom, and then creating silk on that loom, creating just like bolts of fabric, then actually creating clothing out of it. Um, so you can imagine why it would be that much more expensive. Uh, for a few reasons, labor intensive, secret method for making it, and just the scarcity of it, which means there's not a lot of it. Okay. Uh, here I was right here. The Chinese were determined to keep their procedure for making silk a secret. Revealing these secrets was punishable by death. Remember, we're in the ancient world. During the Han period, weavers used foot-powered looms. That means it has a foot pedal. Uh, that maybe you've seen before if you've ever seen someone using a sewing machine it often includes a foot pedal and so you you pump the foot pedal and it keeps the spinning wheel happening I think Luke Conan you did the um, Indian spinning wheel so if anyone ever saw his like um, Indian achievement page that he did that was the spinning wheel too um, weavers used foot powered looms to weave silk threads into beautiful fabric garments made from this silk were expensive Let's go back up to the next one. All right. Chinese goods, especially silk and fine pottery, were highly valued by people in other lands. And during the Han period, the val value of these goods to people outside of China helped increase trade. So it's not just silk, but silk was a major thing. As we talk more about it and as you research it for a project that, again, is not going to be until next week, um, people had a certain style of horse that were that was bred to be really strong and fast and, and trained to be used in military. Um, so that, that was highly sought after. And some people say that that was like the first thing that was really um, sought after and, and kind of started this trade route increasing. But silk might not have been the first thing that was traded, but it was by far the most popular. Hence the term Silk Road, but it's not because only silk was traded. A lot of things were traded on the Silk Road. Um, okay, partly because Han armies conquered lands. That's why trade increases, right? These Han armies are, are conquering land outside of China, more into Central Asia, and they see some goods or practices or ideas that they think would be valuable um, that, that Chinese people could trade for. Leaders there told Han generals that people who lived still farther west wanted silk. Again, only made in a city called Xi'an that is still the city today, or Chang'an uh, was the ancient word for it. At the time, Emperor Wu Di wanted strong, sturdy Central Asian horses, that's what I was talking about, for his army. China's leaders saw that they could make a profit by bringing silk to Central Asia and trading cloth for the horses. So this is kind of the beginning of, of increased trade in this region. The Central Asian peoples would then take silk west and trade it for other products they wanted. Okay, here's the Silk Road. And again, this is going to be a small overview compared to how much more you're going to be learning about it through this project next week. Do not worry about this project, even though I keep mentioning it. Traders used a series of overland routes to trade Chinese goods to distant buyers. The most famous trade route, route, right? Not one road, right? But a, a network of roads. Uh, was known as the Silk Road. Here's your definition. 
This 4,000 mile long network of routes stretched westward from China across Asia's deserts and mountain ranges through the Middle East until it reached the Mediterranean Sea. I'm going to scroll down here. These are silkworm cocoons. This is a modern image, obviously, because it's a photograph. But um, elements of it would still be similar to the way that it was originally produced in Han, China. Ancient methodology, modern methodology. All the cocoons, it, it helps to get them wet. I think it makes it easier to unravel, and then they're unraveled here. Um, and then eventually that unraveled silk cocoon is woven through you know, much more of a lengthy process into silk on a loom. Uh, okay, but let me scroll down. I'm going to skip the Buddhism part right here and just show you the map of the Silk Road. So here's Chang'an. Today it's called Xi'an. And that is actually where the Terracotta Warriors are too. Remember we talked about the Terracotta Warriors. Today are located in Xi'an, China. So Chang'an is uh, where a lot of that silk was being produced. Okay, so here we have the red one, which is the Silk Road, right? 4,000 miles, okay? All these blue ones are other trade routes, which most people still consider to be part of the Silk Road, which is a larger network. And we see that that reaches even farther all the way to Rome, right? Because remember, now we're getting later into ancient China, which means we're entering into a time period where Rome is going from a republic, or sorry, going from a major city, a uh, city-state, uh, to a republic to eventually an empire, a massive empire that we'll study once we're back in school, uh, but like toward the end of April and then May. So Rome has gold coins and a lot of other goods, Italian goods that people are really interested in having. So people, um, so the silk would reach all the way to Rome. And the reason we know that um, silk or that, that the gold coins reached all the way to China is there are different tombs of ancient Chinese people that contain Roman gold coins. So we know that the Chinese valued these gold coins all the way from Rome, so much so that they were buried with them, similar to the practices we talked about in, in Egypt and uh, Mesopotamia, where people would be, would be buried with valuable things and trinkets. Um, we'll talk more about the Great Wall later, but here is the process that was made, uh, the progress that was made by the Han Chinese with the, silk, uh, with the um, Great Wall too. Okay, I'm gonna scroll back up and finish this little section. Here's an important detail that I would add to my notes. Chinese travelers did not travel the entire Silk Road. So it's not like someone went all the way from Chang'an all the way to Rome, right? That was not what would happen. You know, that is really, really, really far distance. It would travel part of the way uh, within China and then they'd trade it to another traveler on the Silk Road who would take it farther. Uh, and then maybe that would be its final destination. Or then maybe some of the silk would m make it to Greece. Uh, and then maybe it would make it all the way to Rome. But it would not be like this one incredibly weary traveler who's traveling 4,000 miles. No, the goods would travel that distance sometimes. But the people would not. It would go through many, many different hands. Upon reaching Central Asia, they gave their goods to local traders who would take them the rest of the way. Here's more bullet points. Traveling the Silk Road was difficult. Hundreds of men and camels loaded down with valuable goods, including silks and jade, formed groups. They traveled the Silk Road together for protection. Armed guards were hired to protect traders from bandits who stole cargo and water. A precious necessity, because think about all the deserts they had to travel through. Weather presented other dangers. Traders faced icy blizzards, desert heat, and blinding sandstorm. Named for the most famous item on, uh, transported along it, the Silk Road was worth its many risks. So again, it's only called the Silk Road because of silk, but many other things were, were traded. Silk was so popular in Rome, for example, that China grew wealthy from that trade relationship alone. So forget about all the other cities that China was trading with. They were tra trading with many other hubs and cities. But just the relationship between China and Rome, just the trade that was happening there, made Han China a really wealthy dynasty. Traders returned from Rome with silver, gold, precious stones, and horses. I'm going to stop there. We're going to spend another screencast talking all about Buddhism. So I would put a lot of different bullet points about the Silk Road 
and the definition of the Silk Road in your notes right now. I will talk to you later with more information about our final section of ancient China. Goodbye!